Hello everyone. I'm Rashmi Shamprasad and joining me today is Ajit Koti. We are part of the data science and engineering team at Netflix and are here today to talk to you about pattern matching at scale using finite state machine. One of the areas that our team works on is around optimizing the sign-up flow for someone who wants to subscribe for Netflix. So I'm going to start with an example from there. Let's say someone wants to subscribe to Netflix. They would typically start by landing on the home page. And here we give the op user an option to kickstart the sign-up flow by clicking on the red button that you see on the screen. Now, this leads them through a sequence of steps which involves selecting a plan, registering for some credentials with which they can log in later, providing us with a method of payment before they can finish signing up. Now, this sequence of five steps is the happy path that a user could be on to sign up for Netflix with the least amount of friction. But sometimes, we see that the users take a much longer path to get to the same point. And this might be because they changed their mind about which plan they wanted to have, or what method of payment they wanted to use, or in some cases, even go back and forth between these options, essentially being stuck in a loop, before they sign up. The worst case scenario occurs when someone abandons the sign-up flow midway. So even though our sign-up flow is composed of five key steps, the number of actual permutations that might be occurring out there might be fairly large in number. Let's take a different example, this time from somebody who's already a member at Netflix. And let's say this user decided to play Stranger Things. Now, one of the questions that we might be interested in asking is how did the user get here? Did they specifically search for Stranger Things and then decide to play the title? Or were they already watching the title and were just picking up where they had left off? As you can see, the question in this scenario has morphed very differently. And what we are trying to do here is we are aware of what our destination is and we are trying to figure out what our origins were. There might be other cases where we might be aware of what our origins are and we are trying to figure out all possible destinations the users could have gone to. So essentially, if you could think of all of these steps as milestones, what we are trying to do is trace paths across all of these milestones, if that makes sense. Now, let me walk you through a couple of challenges that we run into while trying to do this. More often than not, our data is spread over multiple data sources which are heterogeneous in nature by virtue of the fact that this data is being logged by several services out there. The volume tends to learn into terabytes or even petabytes at times, and we have to sift through all of that data to gather a simple insight. Once we've answered one question, we are quickly on the path to answer variations of the same question that we might have originally started off with. And this analysis tends to get a little repetitive, considering the fact that we run a really large number of A-B tests all throughout the entire Netflix product. And we are required to do this analysis over and over again to make sure the user experience is still optimal. We might also be doing this sort of analysis to figure out if there are more opportunities out there to make the user experience a whole lot better than it is today. And the number of folks who are asking this question is not restricted just to engineers, but data scientists, analysts, product managers, everybody's interested in these kind of insights. So it certainly doesn't become easy considering the technical expertise of all of these users might be pretty varied if they have to deal with the prior challenges that I listed before. So let's take a look at a couple of ways in which we've typically tried to solve this in the past. A common solution that most people adopt is just collecting up all of these milestones into memory and then applying some sort of wildcard matching on it. So for example, if you see that these are the steps that a user went through, we would simply collect them up into a single string with some sort of a separator and apply some sort of wildcard matching on top of it to see if the path was a match. Now, the syntax that you see here is from SQL, but you could essentially use wildcard matching syntax that might be offered by any language. Now, this is a very simplistic approach and works well if your path is really, really simple. You don't have any forks, you don't have any iterations, you don't have people going back and forth. 
It works really well in such cases. And it works as long as your entire path can fit into memory. So once the collapse string should be able to fit into memory. So this works only as long as all of these assumptions are true. Another approach that people might adopt is using analytical window functions. You could think of window functions as being some sort of aggregations being applied on a slice of data that we care about. So going back to the same example, let's say these were the steps that a user went through. And the question that we were interested in asking is, somebody who landed on a home page, how many of them actually finished sign up? So really, the two pieces of information that we care about are home page and finished sign up. So we can throw everything else away and just focus on these two. So we filter down just to these events and then try to apply some sort of windowing function to figure out what the preceding and the following events were. So in this case, we would use the functions lead and lag, which are offered by some frameworks, to be able to get to this conclusion. This is a slightly better approach than the one that I just described, but it suffers through the same problem when your paths get complex and you start introdu introducing iterations or forks or merges. So it doesn't work too well for that. Option number three, and engineers might relate to this a little more, is organizing your data in a graph data model with the vertices representing the milestones that we want to track. And the edges between these milestones are the paths. Now, this is a good approach and it works well, except that you would have to overload your adjacency matrix with a whole lot of additional information to track loops or how many times people went back and forth, direction, so on and so forth. Again, this is an approach probably more well suited for engineers, as I mentioned, and probably less so for the remaining set of user profiles that I described before. Furthermore, we would have to invest in some sort of frameworks or tools that are more optimized to handle graph data models. And it's important that these tools or frameworks play well with our existing ecosystem of tools. So there's that investment additionally and the overhead of learning something new. So these kind of challenges sort of got us thinking if we could develop some sort of an easy to use solution to work around all of these challenges but yet get to what, where we want to go. So we started by listing out all the requirements of a solution that we would want to build out. Primary requirement, be able to express your paths or flows intuitively. That seems pretty straightforward, we would want to do that. Uh, these paths or flows should support complex iterations. So given that even in a simple sign-up flow, we are seeing users go back and forth. Imagine all of the product flows across Netflix, we want to be able to track more complex iterations in these flows. We already have a problem where we have to tap into multiple data sources to get to the insights that we need. So it's imperative that the solution handles that. And it scales nicely when the volume of data thrown at it grows. Ultimately, we want to make it easy for all the users who are interested in gathering these insights. And so while we are at it, why not throw a bunch of other goodies that make it easy to use and make it work well with our existing ecosystem of tools and frameworks. So basically, we want to keep it all simple is the objective in a nutshell. So with all of these requirements in mind, we put together our framework and called it Conduit. Now, what Conduit does is essentially look for milestones across a bunch of events. And these events could come from various data sources and can have different formats and different structures. It doesn't matter to Conduit. Conduit really cares about three pieces of information. A timestamp when the event occurred, a name by which it can identify the event in the pile of data that is fed to Conduit, and this is a useful construct because let's say you had several sources of truth for the same piece of information, you could designate or name everything logically as one and Conduit would perceive it as a single event and look for it. And the last piece of information that we need is a unique identifier across all of the events. Now, no worries if your data set doesn't have a unique identifier, we could always generate one on the fly. So that's all the milestones taken care of. Next problem, we want to be able to measure all of the paths against some sort of entity definition. And by entities, I mean the slice against which we want to measure things. So with reference to the examples that I covered before, we are trying to look at paths with reference to visitors or customers. And so these become our entities. 
Now, our primary requirement for the solution was to be able to express paths intuitively. Now, we thought about this a little bit, and we even considered an option of writing up our own DSL, and then realized, OK, people are not going to use this. So it kind of made sense to look in existing options that are out there, and it struck us that regular expression notation works out really, really well for this. And if you think about it, it supports all of the constructs that you would expect to see in a path. It supports quantifiers. It supports direction. It supports faults, merges, iterations. You can get as loose or as strict as you want with the notation. And so this works out perfectly. So all we would want to do is just modify the parser to be able to handle event names instead of single character tokens that typical parsers would use out of box or parse for out of box. So regular expressions simplified our first two requirements that we had of the framework. Now, one of the key objectives of sort of doing this exercise is to draw some high-level insights as to where the users are going and you know, where they're spending their time. So it, it's imperative that the framework provides ways to easily summarize the data, or at least gives you sufficient number of hooks to gather some summary insights really, really quickly. And so Conduit does do that. And given the volume of data that we were dealing with, it kind of became obvious that distributed processing was the way to go. So we decided to use Apache Spark as our execution engine within which Conduit would run as a framework. Now, we got a lot of benefits from Spark, and I would like to talk about a little bit uh, about that. So Spark scales really, really nicely as your volume of data grows. And it's already part of our ecosystem of um, dealing with big data, so that worked out great. So we didn't have to throw something new into the mix. The second benefit that you get is Spark is already capable of reading data from several different types of data sources. So it can read files, it can read tables, it can read elastic search indexes, what have you. And given that the Spark community is actively working on introducing new sources from time to time, we would get all of those benefits for free. Lastly, our problem of all of these different data sources being heterogeneous in nature was solved by the fact that Spark has a really nifty set of APIs to make the transformations happen to move the data from a heterogeneous format into a more homogenized structure that can be fed into Conduit. So given that Spark solved all of these problems for us, really what we needed to focus on was just building the framework to handle the pattern matching. So that's what we did, and we decided to use Apache Spark for it. Ajit will be going into more details on how Spark works with our framework to make this happen later on in the talk. Ultimately, we want to make sure that this framework is super easy to use for anybody who has these kind of questions. And so we offer Conduit in two flavors. One is an API, which you could easily integrate into your existing workflows that run any sort of ETL. And so it works really well. It's built on top of uh, Scala. Uh, and our next option is to use a YAML configuration, which can be parameterized very easily. So somebody could build out the configuration once, and it could be used for all of those repetitive use cases over and over again by simply changing the parameters. So these were the two ways in which we simplified how we could make it usable for the users. Now, with all of that being said, I would like to show a quick demo of how Conduit works. And for the demo, I'm going to use a really simple data set uh, for visitor navigation. Uh, it just has four pieces of information. We have a timestamp for the event because we want to make sure that Conduit uh, gets data with timestamps. And we have GUIDs that can uniquely identify the users. We have the country from where the visitor may have seen a particular page, and we have the actual page itself. So in reality, your data sets might be much more wider than this, but we're just focused on these four attributes for the demo. And for running the demo, we are going to be using Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which is set up with Apache Tori. And this is set up using a Scala Spark kernel, which is running Spark 2.3 in the background. So let me just switch to the demo. Is everybody able to see the font? Is it large enough? Or OK, cool. Bigger is better. Bigger is better, OK. Let's make it bigger. OK. OK. So it's pretty straightforward. We just do a simple setup to get Conduit working. So we add a jar, and the jar just becomes available in context, so now we could just use all of the functionality within Conduit. I'm just going to run a bunch of imports, 
and set up some utility methods so that we can see some neat output that comes out of the framework. So we have that running. And Jupyter is super easy to use. I think I've become a big fan of it over the last year or so. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, so we're gonna start by just reading in our data. And as I said, we're just using Spark to read in the data. It already has all of the options to read different types of data set. We're using a very simple CSV here, so we're just gonna read in that data. And just to make sure that we read in the data correctly, I'm gonna look at the schema, and okay, we have the four fields that I talked about, so did not mess that up. And here is what some sample data might look like. So as you can see, we have a GUID that uniquely defines the visitor. We have a timestamp that's available for when the event really occurred, the country where it occurred, and the page that was visited. So these are the basic set of inputs that we have. Now we'll just annotate this data frame, or what you can think of as a logical abstraction over the container that Spark uses to hold your data. Uh, we're going to annotate this data frame to add the columns that Conduit needs. Now, our data set already has two out of the three pieces of information that we want. So we already have a timestamp and we have something that we could use to designate as the event. So that's already there. This data set does not have a unique identifier, so we'll generate one. And so we're just going to do that. It's pretty simple. Now we have the unique identifier added in. And let's see what the data looks like with the identifier added. So you have your GUID, the timestamp, country, event name, and your unique identifier added in. So that's all we need to get Conduit going. And now we can start asking a bunch of questions. So let's start with the same question that I have been going over in the presentation, which is how many people started on the home page and how many people finished sign up? So it's really simple. We just set up some metadata where we specify what our path is. And so we have home page followed by finish sign up. The, the way they are ordered indicates the direction in which we are looking for the events. And the slash is basically a to, uh, an event name separator so that our parser can identify where the event name ends. So that's really simple. As I mentioned, we have entities against which Conduit measures these paths, so we have the GUID available. And so we are going to use the GUID. As you can see, this is a set of strings that it's expecting, which essentially means you could have several entities based on which you could evaluate paths. Now, by default, Conduit would start uh, or sort the data by the timestamp of the events that it sees before it runs any sort of processing. But there are other options to add secondary sorting if you need it. Okay, so we set up the metadata, so that's simple enough. And now I'm going to run the flow analyzer, which is going to process this metadata along with the events that we have to generate the outputs that we need. So as you can see, the analyzer took in the input and then said, okay, your path has two input, two events that I care about. So we have the home page and we have the finished sign up. So I'm going to throw away everything else that's there in the data and just focus on these two events. So this was a learning that we took from our second solution around analytical window functions. So we took a learning from that and made that into an optimization for Conduit. So imagine if you're processing billions of rows and really what you're interested in is maybe 1% of that data, here is how you filter down to that 1%. So it's already doing that for you. And now we just run the analyzer and it's going to do its thing and tell us that four users started the flow and four users finished it. So which means four users started on home page and four users finished sign up. Now, this is the summary inside that we were looking to get, but we also have details about how we got here. So this is what the data set that's processed by Conduit looks like. So we have the GUID that was processed and we generate what is called as a flow identifier. And so this is useful in grouping up all of the events that made up a particular path or flow. And this is uh, particularly beneficial if even for the same entity, they have multiple instances of a single path happening. So every instance would have its own version of flow identifier. So you could see a smaller lens of the data if you wanted. Now within the flow, events that belong to the flow identifier, we generate sequence numbers to indicate how the events were sequenced out before Conduit evaluated them. Now this is useful if your timestamps are of different precisions, like milliseconds, seconds, you somehow normalize it and get it into Conduit, but then they are still you know, conflicting with each other. So the sequence number will definitively tell you this is the order in which the framework looked at it. And it's also useful for other uh, scenarios, I'll get to that in a bit. 
We have the event name and the last piece of information that we add in is the end of flow indicator. Now this is just a Boolean indicator which tells us whether that particular event is the end of the flow that we were looking at. Now this is particularly useful if you had open-ended flows, right? So going back to the scenario I was talking about, which is let's say we know what our origins are and we don't know what our destinations are. And so this is useful because now I know what my destinations are by just filtering down for records that have this end of flow indicator set. So this becomes super easy when you have to scan through the data and say, oh, these are all the possible destinations that the users went through. Getting to origins is also equally simple. We could just use the sequence number one to understand where the user started. So you get to the start and the end of any path pretty easily, and it's a sort of constant time operation. So we just do this, and we see all of the paths that the user went through. Now, let's make a small tweak in this path and just say we want to make sure that the user also hit plan selection. So they picked a plan before they finished sign up. And I'm going to say they did, they may have done other bunch of stuff. So we are going to use the wildcard dot, which is again comes from the regular expression land with a quantifier of star or asterisk indicating there may have been zero or more events that happened between plan selection and finish sign up. So as soon as I change that expression and reanalyze the data, you see that from four flows, it changes to three. So out of the four people who started on the home page and finished sign up, three of them also visited plan selection. But there was one who didn't. So something was different out there. And this becomes a good pointer for users to go and look at and figure out what happened in those cases. So as you can see, we can quickly just make simple changes to just the paths and track all of these different variations that were happening. So let's get into, oh, I did want to mention. So because we added the wildcard notation, now we can see all of the events that happened in between plan selection and finish sign up. So somebody took eight steps to finish sign up, starting from home page, as you can see here. If we look at the next sequence, again from home page, but this time they took six steps. So again, this is a good way to tease out, okay, is the number of steps the same every time? It's probably not. So something's going on out there. Maybe they're going back and forth between different options. So this is particularly useful to do deep dives into what's going on out there. Um, now let's say we want to look at events in a sequence, but a whole combination gets repeated over and over again. So people start on home page, they go to plan selection, and then go back to the home page and go to plan selection again. So this sort of back and forth can be easily represented by just grouping these two events together in the parentheses that you see there, and then say the user should have done this sort of sequence at least once. And this, again, notation comes from regular expressions. Nothing new here. So we just run through this. And now when we look at it, we see that five users completed this sequence. And you'll see that the first user did this loop twice. So home page plan selection and then repeated home page plan selection again. And same was the case for the next user. But the third one just did it in one pass. So which means something is optimal out here and people didn't change their mind about it, which means they got through the sign-up flow fairly quickly. So these are some inferences you can draw from the data set that you see. Now, let's say we wanted to get really crazy with our path expression and say, okay, you know, forget everybody else. I want to understand who's going over this loop at least twice, right? So we have home page plan selection. This is our group. And we are using, again, the quantifier notation from regular expressions, which says they should have visited the home page plan selection combination at least twice, and then somehow finish sign up. So this is somebody really, really motivated to sign up. So they went through the process really twice. So we're going to look at who did that. One person. And so. Now, this one person is clearly motivated, and hence they went through the sign-up flow. But somebody else could have just said, oh, OK, this is too much for me. I'm, I'm going to drop off. And that's a lost opportunity for Netflix and for the customer to have a lot of joy watching movies and TV shows, what have you. So, 
So, you know, this is how you could, you know, get to more complex insights if you wanted to by just tweaking. So as you can see, the expression is only like a one-liner and you just make changes and all of the magic happens. Now, the last example that I want to cover is around being able to summarize this data easily. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is eventually the insights that we care about, like some sort of summary statistics. So now I'm going to, the question that I have in mind is, okay, we have home page and we have finished sign up. Tell me everything that happened in between and tell me how many steps does somebody take between home page and finish sign up. And I'm going to make one more tweak and this is for users who care about some sort of conversion rates or you know, funnel entry, exit ratios and things like that. We're going to set this particular parameter, which I did not show you guys before, which is set to false by default, saying we're going to allow incomplete flows, which means we're going to allow people who start the flow but don't necessarily finish it. I'm going to set it to true and just run through this and we're going to see some stats in about two seconds. There we go. So now you can see that for people who finish sign up, the most number of steps that somebody took was eight, the least number was six. But for people who abandoned the sign up flow midway, the most number of steps that they took were nine, and the least number that they took was one. So the one use case you could explain away, maybe they accidentally somehow landed on the home page and then they just abandoned. But somebody who went through nine steps, that would be really frustrating for them to not make it all the way to finishing sign up. And so these are the use cases that our analysts or data scientists would try to optimize for when they are working on the product. So this was a pretty short demo of all the features that Conduit offers. Actually, it offers a lot more. I'd probably run out of time if I had to go through everything. But hopefully, this gives a taste of what we can really achieve in a really short period of time. Uh, now, I'd like to hand it off to Ajit, who will talk in detail about how all of this magic happens under the hood. Thank you, Rashmi. Hello, all. I'm Ajit Koti, and I work in data science and engineering at Netflix. This is my third time at String Loop, and I absolutely love it here. Today, I plan to delve uh, more into the architecture and design of Conduit. There are plenty of well-known solutions which can parse a regular expression and find patterns in a string in a single processor systems. But there are few, very few known solutions which can parse a large volume of data and find patterns. Keeping some of these as our guidelines. Sorry, something this light. Keeping some of these as our guiding principles, we wanted to design a system which can scale horizontally and match billions of patterns. We want to also wanted to build a system which is easy to debug and reason about, and reason about and find why a particular pattern did not match. We also wanted to build a system which is easy to enhance and add more features. We recently added a feature which is to match or give, you, give us the output of impartial matches if some part did not fully match, but we still want to see it as a part of the output, we added that feature. So we'll soon see how, how we've done this. And before that, I wanted to quickly uh, define some of the building blocks we had. Uh, one of them is regular expression. Regular expression is a sequence of characters that define a search pattern. Uh, for me, uh, regular expressions are wildcards on steroids. Then uh, other uh, uh, building block is abstract syntax tree. Abstract syntax trees are data structures that are used to represent the result of a syntax analysis. Abstract syntax trees are also the central data structures that we use throughout. They also have very less information of the real syntax compared to the parse tree. Parse tree have dense information. Uh, also due to the hierarchical nature of abstract syntax trees, we also refer them as hierarchical trees. The last uh, building block we use is the finite state machine. Uh, finite state machines are abstract machines that has a finite number of states and transitions between those states. And in response to external events, uh, the state transitions and, uh, into, into, another, in, into another state. 
This is our game plan. Uh, we want to pass the regular expression for a given path into a syntax tree as a first step. So we use Scala's parser combinator to parse the regular expression and construct the individual expressions. Uh, parser combinator are just a higher order function that accepts several parsers as inputs and returns a new parser as, as, as its output. And each parser parses the individual regular expressions. We use these expression types to denote the different individual expressions. Event, uh, event represents a token. A concat represents one or, uh, concats is used to join multiple expressions or a token, or is used to represent, jo to join, or, or used to represent match one of the tokens. Bounded repeat and unbounded repeat represents zero or more or occurrences of a token or an expression. We'll soon see how we use this construct to build the syntax tree. So we'll use one of the examples which we previously used uh, in our demo, which is home page followed by plan selection, followed by any event, and followed by finish sign up finally. Looking at just the regular expression string, it's, it's not easy to recognize that they have a hierarchical nature. But we'll soon see that they have a hierarchical nature. Also note that we can build a regex engine without building the syntax tree, but it will be very simple to evaluate regular expressions by building syntax trees. So as a first step, uh, we uh, convert all the events, uh, which are the, all the milestones, which is the home page, plan selection, and finish sign up as event expressions. And uh, finally, we convert the any expression as a repeat expression so that we can match multiple events. And to build the hierarchical syntax tree, we uh, use the concat expression to join, the multi join all these expressions and form a tree. Note that we can use the syntax, uh, syntax tree we generated to pass the regular expression, but that will complicate the code. Instead, if you could lower the abstraction, it will be much simpler to build a system which is easy to debug and reason about. As the next step, we'll see how we convert the syntax tree into state machine so that the evolution becomes easier. To build the finite state machine, we use the following states, which is the accept, which can consume any event, fork, which can split a transition into multiple transitions, a bounded repeat and unbounded repeat represents one or more occurrence of a transition. A matched and unmatched indicate whether a pattern matched or did not match. We'll soon see how we use this construct and uh, construct the finite state machine. Finite state machine also represents our rejects. It linearizes the rejects components into a graph, producing a format which is A state followed by B state followed by C state. By using this graph, it's very easy to evaluate against potential events and find a pattern. So the, the methodology or the approach outlined in next slides uh, was originally outlined in Ken Thompson's 1968 paper, which is regular expression search algorithm. B previous search algorithm used backtracking and backtracking whenever a, whenever a pattern did not match, it was very costly because you had to go back and then that would uh, mean that you have to do a lot of bookkeeping. Instead, in this paper, uh, uh, the approach which was outlined was that we could evaluate multiple states at once. So we use some of these approaches and convert the syntax tree into a state machine. To convert the syntax tree into state machine, the first thing we do, do is we create an accept for the home page node. If we receive a home page, home page, and the accept node will transition into the plan selection node. If it did not, then it will uh, transition to unmatched node, and the pattern matching halts at this point of time. So let's say we receive home page, the accept node matches, and it transition to the next state, which is the plan selection. The plan selection, let's say if after home page we get a plan selection, then the plan selection accept node matches, and it transition to the next state, which is the unbounded repeat state. The unbounded repeat state has a fork at its one of its end. And the fork has two ends, one which is any. Any events can be matched and it'll loop it back to the unbounded repeat. And the other end goes to the finish sign up. And the finish sign up, if it receives a finish sign up, it'll match and it'll transition to the next state, which is the match state. As the next step, we'll see how we'll use the state machine to evaluate events. So let's say we have this data set, which is home page, uh, followed by plan selection, followed by provide payment, and followed by finish sign up. And 
If we pass this, uh, if we stream this data set to the state machine, then this is how the evaluation would happen. So as the first step, we'll pass the home page to the home page accept node, and this would match and it'll transition to the next state, which is the plan selection node. So the next event we get is the plan selection, and we send it to the accept node of the plan selection. It will match and it'll transition to the unbounded repeat. The next event we get is provide payment. So the po provide payment, we send it to the unbounded repeat, and unbounded repeat will redirect it to the fork, and the fork will send it simultaneously to the both any and the finish signup. And in this case, any would match, and it will loop it back to the provide payment. So the last event we get is the finish signup. It has the same trajectory as before. The finish signup, again, we send it to the unbounded repeat, and unbounded repeat redirects it to the fork, and the fork will send it simultaneously to the both, any and the finish signup, but in this case, it will match to the finish signup and will transition to the match state, and we have found a pattern as matched. So we'll see another scenario. Um, let's say instead of, uh, instead of plan selection, we got a login event, right? And we send it to the plan selection node. In this case, the accept node would not match, and it will uh, transition to the unmatched state, and the pattern matching will halt at this point of time. To scale pattern matching horizontally, we use Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a fast and general purpose cluster computing system which distributes the data across the cluster and parallelizes the operations across on the distributed data set. So looking, going back to the example which is used in the demo where we partition the data set by GUID and sort it by the event timestamp. Uh, let's say if we have a billion GUIDs, then we'll have a billion partitions. And for each billion partition, we'll create a state machine. Note that not all the billion, uh, billion state machines would be active. Only, only there will be active as many partitions we are processing at that point of time. So let's take a deeper look and let's zoom in how the evaluation happens within the Spark node. So we send events using the map partition functionality provided by the Spark, which is just, just a regular map object, but it loops over a partition, which sends an event to the state machine, and the state machine will send it by in response, it will give you in the next state. So, so let's say if, if the map partition sends an event and we get a st uh, state which is matched, and we still have events to process, in that case, we create a new state machine and then evaluate the rest of the events. But it could also happen that, uh, uh, but that the stream has ended, and we send the state machine, but the state machine does not respond back with the match. In this case, this will mark the whole flow as unmatched, and the pattern matching halts at that point of time. So as Rashmi mentioned before, we also do certain optimizations. Let's say if your, if your path was only home page and finished sign up, and no, there's no any uh, node in between, right? So since we know, need only home page and finished sign up, we can do all the filtering upfront. So we only, filter, we only keep those events which we require, which is home page and finished sign up, and then pass it again to the Spark and State Machine, which will evaluate and send back the results. But by doing this, we can optimize and improve the performance. Note, but again, if there is any expression in your event, you cannot do this filtering upfront. So I've uh, linked out few references and blogs which we found were particularly useful during our development of Conduit. Uh, love to open it for any questions you may have. <laughs> that makes sense. So we can take the next question. Uh, do you support, say, multiple, matching multiple patterns on a single pass-through data? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, we During evaluate the them. Uh, yeah. So the question was, do we support matching multiple patterns simultaneously over a single pass of the data? So originally, that was our plan. Uh, but then we figured that the, given that the amount of time that it takes, uh, to do even a single pass is not that high uh, with a significantly large volume of events. We just figured keeping the API simple to just do one path at a time made more sense. But we, yeah, something we might consider in the future. Just uh, to add on, to improve the performance, what, what we also do is we cache the data. Yes. 
So we don't have to kind of rebuild the data set again, and then we can put, uh, run multiple expressions at that point of time. Yeah, so Spark offers um, caching, if for those who are not familiar with. Um, at Netflix, we have uh, another special caching feature, which is called Materialize, where we, uh, once the data gets shuffled across the various nodes, it get, just gets stored on the shuffle servers. And so we just reread that same data without having to reprocess all of the transformations over, over and over again. So that makes it super optimal. So even if we have to make like 10 passes over the data, it's pretty efficient. Yes. Did you make Sorry. Oh. Okay. <laughs>